I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Peter Capelli. Uh, Peter, as many of you know, is the George W. Taylor Professor of Management at the Wharton School and the director of Wharton's Center for Human Resources. With degrees in industrial relations from Cornell and labor economics from Oxford, he has dedicated his career to advancing the field of human resources. Peter was recently named by Vault.com as one of the 25 most important people working in the human capital space and by Recruit.com as one of the top 100 people in the field of recruiting and staffing. He received the 2009 Pro Award from the International Association of Corporate and Professional Recruiters for con Contributions to Human Resources and is a National Assembly of Human Resources Fellow. He currently serves on commissions for the Business Roundtable, the World Economic Forum, and the U.S. Department of Labor. While we heard a bit from him yesterday, today we will hear more about his recent research which focuses on the changes in employment relations in the U.S. and their implications. He has explored the decline in lifetime employment relationships, the strategies that employers should consider in developing and managing talent, and myths about older workers and how employers can better engage them. In his session this morning, Peter looks at the ways HR is becoming more agile in the face of today's ever-changing and uncertain business environment. Applying the general principles, without adopting all the tools and protocols from the tech world, you could say HR is going agile light. It's a move away from a rules and planning based approach towards a simpler and faster model driven by feedback from participants. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you. Folks, let's take a quick minute uh, because new people are coming in, and I would just like you to introduce yourself to the people sitting next to you if you haven't done that already. If you've done it already, tell them something surprising about yourself. Okay, I forgot this is a talent uh, acquisition group. Don't hire each other. <laughs> HRO today gets a commission out of that if anybody changes jobs uh, as a result of this conversation. We're going to talk about Agile this morning, and we're going to try to straighten out uh, some of the noise. There's a ton of noise around topics like this. Um, as we just heard, I'm a professor at the Wharton School, which means that uh, I'm not selling anything. I've also got tenure, which means I can tell you whatever I want. Uh, they can't fire me, more or less, so all that's probably uh, helpful and useful. Just a quick word about the Wharton School, the center I run there, the Center for Human Resources, which is the oldest research center uh, in business in the world, because we were the first business school, right? It was actually started in 1919 as a research center for women researchers. Then the topics they studied, absenteeism, turnover, changes in wage rates, hiring, right? The evergreen issues we're still talking about today. You think about Wharton as a finance school, but scientific management, Frederick Taylor, time motion studies was all invented at the University of Pennsylvania. The uh, Elton Mayo and the human relations movement began at Wharton. Elliot, um, he began his career, Mayo, at the Wharton School. The Tavistock Institute, if you know that one, in the 1980s was at the Wharton School. So we have a long history in this stuff, okay? Uh, there's a bunch of things in the news uh, that is getting a lot of our attention. These are all things outside of the organization, right? None of these are true, by the way. Uh, none of these statements are true. Happy to talk to you about why they're not true at some point, if you like. The most important things that drive our lives in business, though, are not technology, they're not things outside the organization, and they're particularly ideas, right? Ideas about how we should be running the organization and how we should be managing people in particular. The next one, which seems to me is a pretty big one, is this idea about agile, and you'll see in a minute, it's not such a new idea, but what's important about it is it's being driven by the top. Right, from folks at the top of the organization, not from, inside, not from uh, consultants really, not uh, the kinds of things that you usually see with fads. Right? So let's talk about what Agile is. Before we get into that, let me give you a quick uh, anecdote that will explain a lot about what's going on with Agile. Uh, we've all heard about emotional intelligence, right? Yep, 
do you remember the original book on emotional intelligence with the title Emotional Intelligence? It was by uh, a guy named Dan Goldman, who was at the time a science writer for the New York Times. And the book was about neuro neuroscience and how we learn things. And it was about the crucial role of the amygdala in your brain and how with emotion, certain things really get embedded in our heads. Is that what emotional intelligence sounds like to you? Not at all, right? What he discovered and everybody discovered is that term emotional intelligence sounded so evocative and it sounded so much like we were learning stuff about emotions that he completely bagged what he had originally written about and just switched and started talking about something completely different and that is understanding emotions. Not what the book was about at all, right? Something very similar is happening in Agile. And that is, it's a term which has a pretty clear meaning, at least originally, but the meaning is being altered because it sounds so useful in other fields. And here's what's going on. It does not mean flexibility. Uh, agile, as we'll see in a minute, is about project management, but it's becoming increasingly something that people talk about as being about flexibility about we want our organization to be more adaptable. We want our organization to be able to flex, okay? It's an interesting question. We know a fair bit about how to do that. It's not a new question, right? Uh, and we could talk more about that at some later point. That is not what Agile is about. Agile is a way of managing projects. And it comes out of the IT world and you can see where it would come from if you think about an IT startup firm. First, what do you know about IT startup firms? There's nothing there, right? There's a few smart people, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to come up with software, which is something which is kind of creative. There's usually not a template as to how to do it. There often are lots of different ways to solve problems with software. It's not like there's just one and we're going to find it, right? And it is a process that involves innovation. So. In 2001, the guys at Adobe who were doing the software writing went out on a retreat and they decided to write up what do we know about how to make software effectively, how to do it in a good way, how to build good software. And they came up with something that's known as the Adobe Manifesto. You can search this uh, on the internet, find it pretty easily. It's a very simple one-page document, about 12 items in it, right? But the essence of it, and this is really important for people in human resources, get this in red, the essence of it is putting people and the way they deal with each other interactions above processes and planning. So people here, plans, structures here, right? And if you want to think about what this amounts to, imagine you in your current organization had a conflict between what the CFO wanted and a team managing a project. And the team managing the project wins every time. Imagine how different that would be from the world most of us live in. That's what happens with Agile. We're putting the team in an empowerment situation so much that they can override what the CFO wants in terms of structures, plans, requirements for reporting, ROI requirements at the end, all that stuff. Now, some of this is because of the recognition that if you think about what CFOs typically require and the planning that goes on, we have to tell them what we're going to make before we've started to make it, right? We have to tell them what it's going to cost and how much it's going to cost at each period, how much of that's going to be labor costs, staffing, how much going to be capital, what it's going to look like when we're finished making this thing we haven't started making yet, and then what's the rate of return on this thing that we don't even know what it is yet, right? That is, as many people describe it, really just wishful thinking, right? It never made sense to do, but it solved problems that the CFO had. What's happening now is people at the top of the organization have said, uh, look at the ability to come up with innovations faster and cheaper is so important that we're gonna shut the CFO up and help you do it, right? Now, 
That seems to me like a revolution in the way we run our businesses. And my guess is in most of your businesses now, you're not able to do that. Some of them you are, and we'll talk about those and why it happens in a minute. Here are the components of what Agile project management is. Collaboration, you hear the expression Scrum a lot. In some places, people have taken Scrum to mean Agile, consultants who are selling solutions to Agile. Uh, you may know if you ever watch rugby, the scrum is that moment in rugby where the team comes together and they huddle up like this and they're all face to face. I never knew what they're doing in there because I don't play rugby, which is why I've still got all my teeth in the front, right? What they're doing is they're talking to each other and they're trying to figure out what we're going to do next. What's the next play? How are we going to do this, right? So the expression scrum in a team is complete transparency. We're all sitting around. We're talking about what we're gonna do. It's not a supervisor cooking it up and coming in and telling everybody. It is in this open, face-to-face -face interaction that we're figuring out what to do. A second big principle is we're bringing the users in early all the time, trying to figure out what we're going to do. Back at the very beginning, the design phase, and it could very well be in an agile project that you change what you're gonna build. You go in and think you're gonna do this, the customers tell you, yeah, you know, we don't really need that, we need this, and you actually change the whole direction of what you're gonna do. The next thing you talk about, you hear, is this idea of a sprint, have you heard that one? The sprint is basically, in any project you've probably ever done, you run into some component of the task that's hard, really hard, unanticipated. That's what a sprint is. We then raise our hand and say we need more help, we need more money for this, we need more resources, we need help from human resources to get staff faster. That's what a sprint is. At that point, we need help, we need it fast. As soon as we get that through that problem, we give it all back. We don't need it anymore, right? A typical project management process, you gotta tell them months in advance what you're gonna need and what you're gonna use, and you have to live with whatever you've got. The sprint approach is you don't tell them in advance, you figure it out as you go, you raise your hand, and they give you the help when you need it, right? The last thing is this idea of fast prototyping. You may have heard that expression, fast prototyping is, let's not try to build what we thought we were gonna build, and let's not try to deliver something perfect before we get feedback on it. Let's just get something, as they say, that will stand up, that somebody could look at and give us a reaction to. And then let's fix whatever they don't like and ask them again. And then fix that and ask them again. So you can see this idea of feedback being crucial to the idea of Agile. And you can also see why the companies that are giving up performance appraisals are often the ones that are trying to go Agile. Because the idea of feedback all the time is what the Agile process is about. And the idea of typical performance appraisal, we're gonna wait till the end of the year to tell you how you're doing, conflicts with this general idea, okay? So, uh, this is actually pretty evocative little cartoon here. So, a typical chef might say, you know, they follow the recipe, it's been in the oven for 30 minutes at 350, which is what it's supposed to be, it's done, right? The agile chef is testing the thing all the time and saying, I don't know if it's done yet. I don't know if it's done yet. Let's try now, right? And that's what agile is about, constant feedback, right? Think about these prior revolutions. You probably lived through some of these TQM early on, lean production, if you've gotten to that one. And what agile is, is an extension of all these things. It's about empowering the frontline workers, moving from giving them information on quality and asking them to see if they could fix quality problems. Two, in lean production, giving them information on quality and performance and seeing if they could get better. And agile is a step well beyond that. Giving them information on everything and telling them to just go solve the problem, right? So you start to see what a big change this would be in organizations if you took it seriously. It's about a radical empowering of teams, project teams in particular, right? Now, uh, here's just a reminder that you could take something really simple, as I just described, and you can turn it into something incredibly complicated. So this is a piece of descriptive process from a consulting organization 
showing you how you might use Agile to develop software. Now, I can't follow this thing myself, right? Uh, but you can see that it is easy to gum this thing up with a bunch of processes, and particularly in the world of engineering where they love processes, right? They take something simple like Agile, which is basically about not using processes, and they dump a bunch of processes in order to get to no process, right? I mean, it's just insane, right? Uh, and this is something that you probably have to guard against because if you're a consultant selling solutions, nobody's gonna buy what I just described to you because it's so simple. So they're gonna complicate it up, right? But the idea itself, pretty simple, right? Who's using it? Well, in the IT world, 90 plus percent of IT departments around the world, not just software companies, but your own IT departments have been using Agile for a while, right? What is driving this? Uh, the CEO survey at PwC, but others as well, some of which I'm closer to, have been arguing that what they need now is innovation. And where are they gonna get innovation? They're looking to Agile to give it to them, right? So this push to become Agile is something that's up at the CEO level. The push is about innovation, though, right? They're not doing Agile just for the sake of doing Agile. And if you hear a business leader talking about they just need to become Agile, they're just mimicking buzzwords, unless they're talking about why they want it. And the sensible approach is we want it because it allows us to innovate. That's the big thing, right? It allows us to come up with creative and new solutions. So one of the things that sec suggests to you is there are places where this probably does not make sense, right? And there are places where it absolutely does. It is spilling over from software to manufacturing. It is spilled from manufacturing to financial services, to consumer products. It is going on around the business world. Um, but there's more noise than there is reality. There are a lot more companies talking about they are going agile and are actually doing none of these things. They're just trying to talk about flexibility, right, which is something quite different, okay? How it got adopted? Well, I just described the Silicon Valley model. In those models, there was no planning anyway. There was no CFO, there was nobody around, so this is what they did, right? They couldn't plan, they couldn't structure. There's an interesting story about uh, ING in particular, where they were trying to create product teams to figure out how to sell financial services to their customers through online means. And they created a project team and they put IT people on it, some of the programmers on it. And what they discovered after they left them alone for a little while is the programmers taught the team how to do agile. And suddenly at ING, all their project teams became agile, right? And it became, it wasn't on purpose, it was something that evolved by putting these folks together in the same room. The IT people knew how to do this kind of innovative project management. And my favorite example of this comes from GE Appliances. How many of you have, anybody here have a monogram refrigerator from GE? No? Well, <laughs> it is the number one uh, Consumer Reports best refrigerator. And here's what they did at GE. They went to Louisville where they build manufacturing stuff for appliances and they said, we gotta have a better refrigerator. And the reason is, if you've ever redone your kitchen and you started to look at those sub-zero ones and the really cool ones, the Thermador ones, right, that everybody wants, they cost, I happen to know this because we've redone a kitchen, they cost about six, seven thousand dollars, right? And GE's looking at this and saying, there's a ton of margin to be made here. So what we want you guys to do is build us a new refrigerator. We took a cross-functional team, we put them together in Louisville, and we said, we're gonna give you whatever support you need, okay? And what they did, cut to the chase is, they built a new refrigerator in half the time of a typical one in the past, at half the cost of a typical one in the past, and it's Consumer Reports number one rated refrigerator, and most important for me, it's the first appliance I've ever bought and paid retail for, and the reason is because it's only $2,200, and the sub-zero that my wife wanted was $7,000. So that's why we have a monogram refrigerator, and by the way, it's a terrific refrigerator. If you're following IB, and by the way, I don't get anything from GE for saying that, although I could if you're listening, GE folks out there, I, I would appreciate a new monogram stove to go with the refrigerator. 
Uh, IBM has got a bet the company uh, initiative going on where they're trying to push Agile into everything they do. So watch those companies to see what happens to them there. Here's the planning model we used to talk about. And for those of you who are close to performance management, you'll remember the very end of this process of the waterfall model of cascading down is you wanted it to go to individuals, set your goals for this year. They're supposed to cast K down from the top. Well, that was fine when the plans were long term and they really worked. It doesn't make sense when the plans change all the time. And it is the opposite of this agile approach. So let's get to what's different about this. We've already talked about these elements. What's to imply for human resources, right? Well, performance management, uh, I talked about this at this conference a couple of years ago. The efforts to get rid of the end of the year annual performance appraisal, a lot of them driven by this agile move. Why? There's no goals that you could cascade down from because we know what we're going to build until we actually start the team out and get in the middle of it. And the idea of constant feedback that goes on in agile teams with the customers spills over to constant feedback within the team about how things are going. So the, I the idea of continuous feedback in the workplace with your supervisor spills down from continuous feedback with the clients on the business side, right? So that's why performance management is changing in these organizations. That's why GE gave up their annual performance appraisal. That is why IBM gave it up as well, and they say it's because we're going agile, right? What has to change about learning? Think about that sprint model, right? The sprint model means we need resources when we discover we got a problem and we need them right away, we can't wait around for this, right? And so there's a bunch of efforts going on to try to get people training immediately, to try to figure out, maybe through machine learning, what kind of skills you're gonna need next when you're going down a particular project path, right? Trying to anticipate it in advance. But the learning idea here is get it faster, right? Get the right modules of learning to people faster. So forget about the you know, annual cycle of learning and what you're offering when. See if you can get them to it faster. IBM's got probably the coolest stuff on this, which is tailored, customized little bots that will help you figure out what you should be learning next, given the kind of projects you've done already, given the training you've done already, and what you're likely to be working on next. Compensation makes perfect sense what's going on with this, right? The end of the year merit pay increase doesn't fit in very well if you want to reward what people are doing in their project teams. This project is four months, this one is seven months, but we're only going to give you an annual performance appraisal merit pay increase five months into your second project. It doesn't make any sense, right? So you see these sorts of things, right? Like more spot bonuses. And some of these companies doing pretty radical things, like Patagonia, uh, which is saying, you know, the real unit here is no longer the individual. It's the team. It's the project team. So we're going to dramatically play down individual rewards and play up team-based rewards, right? This is a fundamental conflict with the way human resources has been practiced, which has all been focused on individuals, individual accountability. This is a really radical departure to say, N not doing that anymore. We're going to focus on teams as the unit of analysis, right? And recruiting, uh, which is an interest to a lot of folks here, uh, if you search for this phrase, agile recruiting, GE has a white paper they developed and published, and you can see it. Uh, and the person who wrote that apparently has gone to IBM, so they're doing the same stuff at IBM. Uh, about how they were able to respond faster to these sprint demands from project teams through recruiting. And it has a lot to do with, in the recruiting side, moving from individual recruiters to team-based recruiting, sharing information about candidates, sharing information about needs across the way, uh, and setting up the recruiting function as if itself was kind of a agile-based project, right? Simple things they do, like uh, they don't start requisitions when they get them. They only start them when the folks who are doing the hiring have absolutely completed everything they're going to need to do because 
They don't want to have to stop in the middle of these things, right? And there are vendors who provide this kind of stuff and vendors who will give you assessments as to how well people are likely to perform in agile work environments, right? So the vendors are in this space already, right? So what has to change about human resources? Some big, big things when you move in this direction. The focus on individuals, as we said before, given way to a focus on teams. And with that, a focus on understanding team dynamics, right? Being able to diagnose what's wrong with teams, being able to give them help fixing them, being able to figure out how to make teams work effectively. This move toward completely empowering teams sounds like a very simple thing, right? Unless you've ever been in a team environment and you know that teams can get dysfunctional really fast, right? And having the capabilities to do that is now way more important than it was before. The ability to sell organization change, which is not a new capability, but it is increasingly important because trying to make this happen inside the organization, trying to get people to take this seriously, means that a lot of folks who are on the planning side have to give up power, right? Including the CFO. So a lot of organizations are finding that they're flipping out their old CFOs because the CFOs can't live with this new model. Uh, and there are organizations of CFOs that are trying to figure out how to operate in an agile environment right now because it's a big, big change, okay? So let me stop there for a minute. We just got a couple of minutes uh, left to respond to questions or things that you folks are seeing out there. This is a big fight. Imagine this one. You have the CFO, who was the most powerful player in the room, is going to have to give up a lot of their control to these project teams. Are they gonna do it willingly? Probably not. Why might it happen? Because the CEO at the very top is weighing these two bets. The CFO is telling me we need predictability, we need control, because that's what the markets want. But on the other hand, the board and other people are saying we need innovation, because if we don't have new products, we're dead. How do we get new products? Agile. That means taking power away from the CFO. I don't know, you can decide yourself which way in your own organization that debate is gonna go, who's gonna win, uh, and it's not gonna be a pleasant fight. Fortunately for us, it's usually a level above us, so we're not caught in the middle of it. Uh, but often, the CFO is losing because that need for innovation becomes crucial and really important. Now, on the other hand, you don't want everybody innovating Right? You don't want every team to be agile. If I'm going in for surgery, I do not want that surgical team huddling around in a scrum and figuring out how they're going to cut me today. Right? I'd like them to, to have worked all that out well before and to do it the same way they've been doing it forever. I don't want a nuclear power plant built by an agile team. Right? I'd like that stuff, which is so complicated and has to be so precise, to be done in a traditional execution manner. Right? So this is not for every organization. It's not for every part of the organization. Let's pause there and see if you guys will raise some thoughts and things that you'd like to talk about or things, questions you've got or things like that. we got microphones standing by, as they say on TV. I think I've stunned them. No, wait, here they go. Upper hands are up there. Yes. So what does this do to the notion of integration sciences and CMMI, the capabilities maturity models? Do those things live together or is this a departure from that? Uh, I'm not sure I know all the things that go on with those, but I would say uh, it, it departs from anything that looks like long-term planning based stuff. It doesn't depart from things that are measurement based, like we're gonna put these things together so we can see how stuff is going on. But anything that looks like long-term planning bumps up against what the project teams are doing. And the question is, can the project teams live with that or not? You know, I don't know. Yep. Other thoughts? We had a bunch of hands up there. Yeah, go ahead. So, so Peter, I mean, if, if you think about the use of Workday or Infor or SAP, these are workflow programs that are process-oriented where everything's locked up. Yep. We're spending millions of dollars annually on these programs. Yep. But meanwhile, we're now pushing, you know, agile, uh, w w 
let's not call them workflows, but, but yep. teams. Yep. And so where we store this data and how we engage with this information is completely counterintuitive to our capital development. So right. any comments on that? Yeah, something's gotta give, right? Uh, something's gotta give. And at the moment, what's giving is all that planning stuff and the data storage and the way we organize that stuff, which is frankly based on a really old model of the way business worked, right? It's based on that model of business with five-year business plans, which came out of the 1950s, right? That's our model for how we organize data. That's our model for how we do planning. And honestly, does anybody really think your business operates with a five-year plan anymore, right? So to some extent, this is simply a catching up of the way business has been evolving in a while, but it is a pretty big leap, right? to really empower these teams. Now, if these are one-off teams in your organizations, maybe these, a lot of stuff doesn't have to change. Maybe just have to do some flexing to support those teams, right? Uh, but if it's fundamental and you're the kind of organization where these teams are crucial and there's a lot of them, the whole organization has to adapt to it. Right? Any other thoughts? We had a cluster back there. Somebody else had some hands up. Got one more minute. Okay, let me ask you a question as the clock is ticking down here. Show of hands, if we come back in three years and ask this question, and I don't know the answer to it, do you think this is going to be seen as a fad that has faded or is fading, or is this going to be the beginning of a revolution that is going to accelerate? So fad versus revolution. How many do you think fad? Raise your hands. Uh, how many think revolution? Raise your hands. Ooh. Okay. Um, well, there it is, crowdsourcing. <laughs> We've got the answer here. And we'll check back in three years and see how things go after that. Thank you very much, folks. A pleasure to be with you.